Welcome to church, you guys. Thank you for coming to Saturday night service here at Living Word. I'm honored to be here, and I'm honored to have my wonderful mother in the front row. It's always nice when she comes. She's, that, that bothers her when I do that. Just remember, she did the first six months of sermons here when Living Word was founded in 1979. First six months, she was the preacher. And so we're going to go ahead and we're going to take the offering up front here. And I just want to say as you prepare your offering, yeah, you can clap. There's nothing wrong with that. That just says you're cheerful to give. And as you prepare your offering, we ask um, if you could use an offering envelope located on the seat back in front of you. If you're joining us online, please see the various ways you can give on your screen. And, oh, this, these offering messages, I'm just telling you, I'm just talking straight, right? There's no pressure here. If you feel pressure, then you shouldn't give, right? The Bible says to give from a certain type of heart. But just talking straight, this isn't meant to be condemning. Um, I've just been in the church a long time, I'm 55 years old. I've seen a lot. And, you know, I was just thinking about this. And uh, some Christians uh, do not sow as in planting seeds with their money because their faith and confidence in God wavers. And there's many reasons why it, it wavers. What I'm saying is doubt is one of the reasons that people refuse to sow or people refuse to sow with regularity. I've even heard that people uh, here, even just out on the couch, when, when they're angry at the pastor, uh, sometimes they threaten that they're, they're not going to tithe anymore. I've, I've heard that. And what happens when you do that, you don't hurt the pastor. You've not stopped the ultimately victorious march of the body of Christ towards victory by withholding your tithe. What you did, and I say this in all humility, is you've destroyed the supply line uh, uh, for your own family. And you're creating seasons of not enough in your future. Some people stop sowing consistently because they want to use the money for something special that they want to purchase. This is no condemnation here. So they talk themselves into using the tithe for personal use. And that is one of the re reasons I direct deposit. Okay, I, And based on the Bible, I, I'm saying this is... In all humility, you can't afford to touch what belongs to God. And I'm not trying to offend anyone, but it's a lie from the devil. And what he's doing is trying to move you to a place of financial devastation. The devil despises any flow of blessing into your life. That's why he's so, he was so angry that Job was so blessed. Anything God loves for you is definitely something Satan hates for you. Any God, anything God blesses, Satan tries to curse. There's another group of people, and there's no condemnation, that do not sow with regularity because they're, they, they give as they're feeling it. And I'm just letting you know, I, I know how that feels, but I'm just letting you know that you can't afford to sow into the word of God into church as you're feeling it. We're talking about sowing with regularity. We're just talking about consistent sowing here. And I was reading some books on the subject during the week. And you know, others don't sow on a continual basis because they're in continual crisis. And when crisis comes, they, they quit giving. When they have blessing occurring, that's when they sow. If you sow according to your circumstances only, you'll always sow inconsistently. Therefore, you'll always have an inconsistent harvest. Ecclesiastes 11.4, he that observeth the wind shall not sow. It's in essence what that saying is they are sowing based on how hard the wind is blowing out there. I know this is going to seem straightforward and I can honestly say it's, it's not said easily, but I'm going to say that millions will stay in poverty or in their financial situations because they refuse to sow consistently. I'll even say millions will not advance financially the way they could because they do not sow consistently. 
I'm not trying to offend anyone. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that you guys are just here, whether if you give or not, but I'm going to tell you what's in the Bible. And all the things, and thank, I'm really here just thanking you for all the things that you've given to this church, that God has done through this church, through your giving, and through the seeds that you have sown. You have impacted millions of people around the world. In these 40 years, your faithfulness, living word, is powerful. And I just pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, God's favor. Just give them favor. Favor to their finances. Favor to their lives. Favor to their family economies. Abundance. Make your face shine upon them. Be gracious to them, Lord. Gracious to them. Touch their lives. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. You can go ahead and hand that out, Walt. I had, had a dream about Walt last night. I did. It was a conversation. I was having a conversation with him. And I was telling him in a very serious manner to pray for something. Walt's a prayer. Praise all day. And uh, I coached with him for probably 13 years. And I was, you, you know how you wake up and you just can't quite remember what I was trying to tell him to pray for. But I was in a very serious conversation and he was listening. And he was sitting across a booth from me. It was like we were in a restaurant. And I was like, you have to pray for this. And I was telling him to be specific, right? Pay attention to your dreams in these last days. Revelation 1.1, we are in the book of Revelation. This is Jesus talking, saying, I'm the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. This is Jesus Christ himself speaking to the apostle John who's exiled on the island of Patmos. The reason, a lot of people don't know this, the apostle John was exiled on Patmos is because he refused to burn incense, which was a form of worship to a giant statue of the Roman emperor Domitian. He refused to worship the Roman emperor. This island that John had been exiled to, they had taken all the vegetation off the island. They wanted them to die when they sent them to this island. This island only had one water source on the whole island. John had an associate that was there with him. And for a year and a half, they lived in a cave. And, it, and this is where Jesus Christ appears to him. He's in a cave. And let's look just quickly. This is just quick review. Revelation 120. The mystery this is Jesus still talking. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars of the angels of the seven churches, the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are seven churches. The seven stars, and we've talked about it in three or four of earlier sermons, are the seven pastors. You never can find God holding Angels in his hand in the Bible. But you can find him holding his children in his hand plenty of times. That's just one of the reasons. It can be, there's 14 times in the book of Revelation that word angels is actually a human being. We're, we're in the fifth letter to the fifth church. Jesus, as we talked about, is writing seven letters to seven churches. And he's having John doing the writing. These are applicable to us today. I've said it many times from Revelation chapter 4 all the way through the end of the book, we will be watching from heaven. And I put a lot of hours into this every week, and I'm completely convinced, and with so many commentators, so many scholars are also completely convinced that these letters must be heeded today by the church today by all churches, all denominations, 
just the study of this for me in a lot of ways has really checked, checked me. It's made me more watchful. It's caused me to press in in regards to my relationship with the Lord, and it's really given me a different view of Jesus. I think sometimes that gets overlooked or doesn't get talked about. It's, it's put a fear of the Lord inside of me. But to balance that out, it has made me realize how much his mercy has been extended to me personally throughout my 55 years on this earth. This is number six in the series we are calling Revelation Revealed. It is the letter to the highly esteemed church of Sardis. We're going through six verses tonight. Revelation chapter three, one through six. I just start with the amplified so you get it in both sides. To the angel, that's the pastor, messenger, human messenger, to the assembly church in Sardis, right? These are the words of him who has the seven spirits of God, the sevenfold Holy Spirit, the seven stars. I know your record, what you are doing. You are supposed to be alive, but in reality, you are dead. Rouse yourselves, keep awake, strengthen, invigorate what remains and is on the point of dying. For I have not found a thing that you have done, any work of yours. Meeting the requirements of my God are perfect in his sight. All these other churches get a commendation. They, they don't. A tiny one to a little group of them. So call to mind the lessons you have received and heard. Continually lay them to heart and obey them and repent. In case you will not rouse yourselves, keep awake and watch. I will come upon you like a thief, and you will not know or suspect what hour I will come. Yet you still have a few persons' names in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes, and they shall walk with me in white because they are worthy and deserving. Thus shall he who conquers is victorious be clad in white garments. I will not erase or blot out his name from the book of life. Doesn't mean what you think it means. But we'll get to that. I will acknowledge him as mine. I will confess his name openly before my father and before his angels. He was able to hear, let him listen, and to heed what the Holy Spirit says to the assembly's churches. Sardis, the city itself, was one of the oldest cities on earth. Estimated start time for Sardis 2,000 years before Jesus was born. It was already a city. It's mentioned by the most famous ancient Greek writers and poets. It's a renowned city. At one time, Sardis was the capital of a kingdom called Lydia. The Lydian Empire, it was an empire, you could say one of the top 10 empires in ancient history. Sardis was the capital of this empire. That was about 700 years before Christ. Remember, all these seven cities that these Letters from Jesus are going out to, they're going to the seven churches in these seven cities. They're all located in what we call Western Turkey. Sardis, you could say over the years, got really rich from a river called Pact Pactolus. We have the Greek historian, they call the father of history, Herod Herodotus, wrote a lot about Sardis. Along that river, the Pactolus legend said, is where a king named Midas and the fake Greek gods answered his request that everything he touched would turn to gold. And that's where we get the expression, the Midas touch. It became a problem. If you don't know the story, he turned his daughter into gold because he touched her. He asked to be relieved of this special ability and the gods told him to go wash in the Pactolus River. The legends say the from him washing in the Pactolus River. We know it's just legend. We're filled with the, the Pactolus was filled with gold. The gold flowed downstream, got hung up or magically stopped just outside of Sardis because Sardis was one of the richest cities in history because they constantly were pulling gold out of the Pactolus River. So they were rich. They had a lot of money. Sardis was the first city in history of the world to mint gold coins. There's still gold being pulled out of that area of Turkey today. 
You could say that the very high point of the history of Sardis was they had a famous king named Croesus. This is a real guy. It was said that Croesus was the richest man in the world and by a long shot because of all the girl, gold coming out of that river. He built an amazing, supposedly impregnable fortress at the top of one of the mountaintops of Sardis. So people don't know if Midas existed, but this guy was real. The fortress he lived in was supposed to be impenetrable. This all applies to the letter. It's vaguely familiar with the letter. It wasn't a real, really, it was a mountain. It was a, his fortress was on a cliff. This fortress is a thousand feet up on a peninsula on a mountain, and there was only one end of the fortress to defend. You could only get into the fortress from the south side. You had cliffs on three sides ranging from 1,000 feet to 1,500 feet, going straight up, so you could only approach this fortress from one direction. Well, Cyrus the Great, we heard a lot about him in, Dan in the book of Daniel, attacks Sardis and King Croesus. Remember now, just to give you a heads up, at the base of this cliff was that river with all the gold, the, the Pactolus, which kind of serves as a moat on top of that, it's like a river and then cliffs on three sides. Cyrus pulls his troops, uh, the Croesus pulls his troops and all his village people into the city, inside the fortress, shuts the gates. 549 BC, Cyrus the Great of Persia launches a two week siege on Sardis, but Cyrus takes a different approach. Croesus leaves the 1500 foot cliffs and the walls that were on top of the cliffs unguarded. Because he thought, there's no way. He put all his troops on that south wall, the only place they thought an army could attack from. Cyrus offers millions of dollars of rewards to his soldiers that can figure out how to get up on those cliffs. They saw a Lydian soldier, one of King Croesus' guys, drop his helmet over the battlement. He disappears into a crack in the wall comes out of the crack, gets his helmet, and goes back into the crack, and then he winds up at the top of the wall. So the Persians in the middle of the night scale the side of the cliff, walk into that crack in the wall, and take the city. And historians say that the city of Sardis was taken by Cyrus the Great like a thief in the night. Jesus used the same words, didn't he? Interesting. Interesting which is really interesting because that fits the letter. And apparently the Sardinians did not learn a lesson. There was a famous historian said that history teaches us that man learns nothing from history. And neither did the Sardinians because in 235, 214 years later before Christ was born, these cliffs were scaled again by Antiochus of the Seleucid Empire. You guys should know all these people now from Daniel. That's one of the kings of the north. In Daniel, so the Sardinians did not learn. 549 B.C. fell to the Persians. 501 B.C. burned to the grounds by the Ionians, the Greeks. 334, they surrendered to Alexander the Great. Twelve years later after Alexander's death, Antigonus walked in there and they fell to the Seleucids. One of the kings of the north in the book of Daniel. You could call Sardis a city of failure. For the same reason, every time they left their walls unwatched. The name Sardis becomes synonymous with the promise without performance. A false confidence that always ended in ruin. And in essence, you could say the city of Sardis over and over and over betrayed themselves with arrogance that shouldn't have been there. That is because they were rich. They had a lack of watchfulness and a lack of diligence and too much overconfidence and they were defeated each and every time. A fortress that should have never been entered. And really what's interesting you guys is what Jesus is telling in this letter in a sense this is what he's telling them. And by the time we get in the New Testament the early splendor of Sardis was a, was a thing of the past. There were remnants of what they had, but they were going by their past reputation of splendor. 
Revelation 3.1, the angel, King James, and unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, these things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works that thou hast a name. You got a name now that you livest, but you're really dead. You're dead and you don't even know it. He's telling the church this. We talked about this idiom, the seven spirits of God has already come up in Revelation chapter one. Jesus is saying he has in his possession the seven spirits of God and the commentators that I'm looking at are saying the seven spirits of God is talking about the Holy Spirit himself. Or I've seen uh, Rick, Rick Renner calls it the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And where they're connecting this, the seven spirits of God to the Holy Spirit, if we look in Isaiah 11 too, seven manifestations. These are different than the gifts. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon them, the spirit of wisdom, understanding, spirit of counsel, might, spirit of knowledge, fear of the Lord. You say, well, there's only six there, Jim. Number seven, although we don't see it in the King James, you can see it in the Septuagint. We spent a lot of time talking about the origin of the Septuagint in the Daniel series. That's the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which came along centuries before the New Testament. There are seven manifestations, the Holy Spirit. And in the Greek translation, you get godliness is number seven. The phrase, the seven spirits of God, is an Old Testament idiom for the Holy Spirit. Revelation 3.1, again, unto the angel, the pastor at the church in Sardis, write these things, saith he that hath the seven spirits of God, the seven, the, the seven stars, I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and are dead. If you look at the end of the verse, I know thy works, thou hast a name, thou livest and are dead. What this is saying is this church is living on past glory. What they once were. And it makes me wonder today, how many churches are living because they were once walked in extreme power or, or what they had done. I don't go to other churches, so I don't know. The word thou hast a name, what that's saying in the Greek language by looking at the Greek word anoma, basically that's saying you guys have a reputation that possibly distinguishes you from other churches, okay? And this word means they have a high rank among churches. So Jesus is saying, hey guys, you guys, you guys have a really good reputation. You guys have a high status. And the word, he said, you livest. What that is saying is when Sardis first became a church, it's implying that something incredible, wonderful happened there at Sardis because of that high reputation. They were still living on that. And really what it's saying is the church at Sardis, when it began, it began with power. It gained a really strong reputation. But he straight up called them dead. That Greek word necros, which means dead, means a corpse. They're dead. So the reputation of this church was a really good one, was a strong one, but Jesus is saying, that's not your reality. In reality, you're dead. So the church world viewed Sardis as something other churches would like to be. One thing I'm getting from the deep study on these verses, on these letters to the churches, and it really makes you think when he says to them, I know that works. And I've explained this before in the Greek language. This is explaining that Jesus is personally observing very closely, not just the church, but each individual in the church. Every thought, every passion, every move, and weighing their thoughts, their intents, watching closely. It's the only way to explain the Greek here. When he says, I know your works, the, Eng the English language can't explain everything that, in the Greek very well. But he's observing us at a very high level. 
as we're sitting here worshiping, right? I mean, you're studying this and you're just going wow because you don't necessarily think of it that way all the time. We look at this first verse, we're looking at a very heavy indictment towards this church at Sardis. Uh, v- verse 2, l- let's, let's look at it in the King James now. Be watchful. What does that say in this? Amplified. Keep awake. They were asleep. And strengthen the things which remain. They are ready to die. They're ready to die. The little bit that you have left is ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. The Amplify says, any of your works. So this church is told here to look at its real condition. It's only the Lord that can strengthen the things of the Holy Spirit within our hearts and our lives. Only the Lord. A shrink can't do that for you. Been to a lot of them. But we have to be open for him to do that without real effective spiritual attention This just tells you spiritual things die out. He's telling them to be watchful. That means they weren't being watchful. If they weren't being watchful, they probably didn't care. Romans 13, 11. And that knowing the time, there's so much on watching in the Bible. Just watching. Paying attention. And that knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer. You're going to need it near. You're going to need it near. Paul is basically telling the church in Rome, pay attention. Isaiah 62, 6, I've set a watchman upon thy walls, O Jerusalem, which shall never hold their peace day or night. You make mention of the Lord. Don't. Keep silent. He also tells Ezekiel, who's a prophet of God, Son of man, I've made thee a watchman under the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth and give them warning. Minimally, the preacher should be watching. If the preachers of the gospel don't say anything, Satan easily disguised the error. And just like he did to the last church with Jezebel, and that error will be welcomed. Remember, Jesus commended the church at Ephesus for calling these people out. The phrase, strengthen the things which remain. The word in the Greek, strizo, is the word, describes a solid stake in the ground, you know, that the vines grow up. And it supports the vine, vine, And so it can grow high in the air. This word in the Greek also describes a thick column that supports a roof of a large building. What Jesus was telling the Christians that went to Sardis Church is to stand up and do something. To do that, you have to watch. And you have to pay attention to what they're doing to your country, America. The phrase is in verse 2, strengthen the things that remain that are about to die. What that is saying is word remain in the Greek is loipos. It's saying the little bit you guys have left, you need to shore it up. You need to support it. You need to do something with it because a lot of what you've had is already dead and everything you have left is about to die. So if you guys don't wake up And fight for your country, or as he was telling the Sardinians, fight for your church. Let's look at it again, Revelation 3, 2. Be watchful. Strengthen the things which remain. You still got a chance here, Sardis, that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. And in the Greek, nothing. They are doing nothing right. The phrase, I have not found thy works perfect, that found horisco, and this word in the Greek language is showing that Jesus was involved in every single intricacy of this church, 
and every individual person. It's talking about, again, I'm telling you that the English language does not have the words to explain everything that it's telling you in the Greek. Rick Renner says basically the word found is pointing to a discovery made due to an intense investigation. By who? Jesus Christ. It's a good thing to keep in mind. He's intensely looking at this church. Intensely. Through investigation, scientific study, or scholarly type research. Jesus is saying, I know everything about you, Sardis, from my personal intense observation, and your works aren't meeting even close to the requirements of what my church should be doing and of what I want for my church. You're dead as a doornail. He's saying, remember who you used to be. And he's, he's not just saying it to the church, but to every individual in that church. Remember who and what you used to be, who and what you represented in comparison to who and what you are right now. Remember now, this church had an impeccable reputation because of the results they had and they had operated in, in their early days. And although they were at the point where they were dead, he called them dead, they were still in position to change. If they would start with watching, was the first instruction. Watching what is going around, on around them, America. Revelation 3, 3, remember, therefore thou hast received and heard. Remember what you received. Remember what you heard. Hold fast, repent, and if you shall not watch, if you don't watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. What this is saying is it's telling us that they had received the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they had heard it correctly, that they had spiritual ears, which you would say that, that, that they're ears of faith, because in essence, he's telling them, remember, therefore, how that hast received. Remember how you received and heard? Remember that? There's, there's nothing new here. That means that what they received and what they heard previously was the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you know everything you hear these days is not necessarily the gospel of Jesus Christ? It's something to be aware of in these last days on fallen earth. It's in the Bible. Galatians 1.6, I marvel that you are so soon removed. This is to a church from him that called you into the grace of Christ and you've moved to another gospel. Then that, that word foolish there, or Galatians 3.1, oh, foolish. You know what that word means in the Greek? Stupid. He's calling them stupid. Who has bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified. You know what Paul's saying here? I preach so much Jesus to you that it's like he's crucified among you. It was like he was you. It was you who he was crucified in front of. That's what this verse means. What Paul is saying is he planted this, the church in Galatia that he preached Christ and Christ crucified every which way from tomorrow that he did it so thoroughly that it was as if Jesus was actually crucified among the Galatians. Galatians 1.8. But, but though we, I don't care who it is, is it an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you? I curse him. I curse him. This is how strong the Apostle Paul is talking about these guys that are preaching another gospel. And for the Galatians to turn from this message, considering how important it is, Paul was judging the Galatians, and, and he's calling them stupid. And, and you know, you have the phrase in, in Revelation 3, 3, hold fast and repent. In the Greek translation, it's the word terio, and the meaning of that is describing being armed and guarding. phrase, hold fast, means armed and guarding something. And you're armed. So you're watching. 
and you're guarding what, what you're watching, right? This word repent, it means change your mind, and then it will change your focus, and then and it'll result in change in the physical. I guess to emphasize, let's look at ourselves individually. How many times in my life have I spiritually declined, and I know it the whole way? I ma- mail it in for a week or a day. It's just, it's just something you have to look, say to yourself sometimes, am, am I, have I backed up? Am I in spiritual decline? The first directive Jesus gave them in that situation, start watching what's going on in your church. For us, I believe in America, America the American church. Strengthen those things, those spiritual principles that you still have that are still left even go back to the last thing God told you to do. So interesting here. Where does it start? He goes back in, to it in verse 3. If therefore thou art not watching, if you're not going to watch, if you're not going to pay attention, it starts with paying attention from going from dead to, and no life to get out of that. It starts with watching. It goes back to really the first time the city of Sardis was defeated. Why? They weren't watching their walls. Sorry about that. No, that was. They weren't watching their walls. That's when you, you, you need to take a breath but, breath, but you shouldn't take a breath. So you keep going and your voice gets higher. Are you, are you on the walls? Are you on the walls of the Spirit Living Word? Are you watching your walls? Look at what he tells them. What was the great historian? His name, but it's a famous quote. He said, the city of Sardis was taken like a thief in the night. And he quoted that five, almost six centuries before Jesus says, I will come on, you, on thee as a thief. And you're not going to know the hour I'm coming. And really, he's telling him in the Greek, those words in verse 3. Let's put it up again. Revelation 3.3. 3. Remember, therefore, how you received and heard. Hold it. Remember that. Hold on to it. Change your mind. Therefore thou shalt, and if you're not going to watch, I'm coming. Therefore, that phrase, in that word, that word, therefore, what it's saying is if you don't do what I'm telling you to do, if you don't start watching, you're going to pay a price. The word watch in the Greek means wake up. An awakening. An awakening. Wake up, Church of America. What Jesus is saying at the end of verse 3, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou won't know what hour I come upon thee. You will not know when it's coming. You will not know when it's happening. It will already be done. I would have already dealt with you before you even understand what's going on. You know, I have to point this out. Since the Reformation, the break from the Catholic Church, i.e. Martin Luther. You know, after that break, the Pope and his armies of Jesuits killed hundreds hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people. It's like a hundred years of war after that. I'm just giving you real history here. But the break from the Pope was, in essence, what was being said was the church is not the final authority. The Word of God is the final authority. That's what Martin Luther was saying. And he had his drawbacks, too. But God used him. Okay, what the Pope says is not the final authority. What the word of God says is the final authority and that's what that fight was over. And these illustrious denominations that fought the good fight that should be credited with fighting the good fight to break from the Catholic Church have completely regressed and become rigid, dead. I'm sorry, but I think you could call some of these denominations completely dead. Revelation 3.3. 3. Remember, therefore, 
how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come unto thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Remember the other side of this statement. If you do remember how you received and what you heard, and you do hold on to that, and you do change your mind, you won't be caught like a thief in the night. It was not too late. It's talking about being watchful. Remember Matthew 25, the 10 virgins? Five watched, five didn't. It's all about watching. Matthew 25, 13 amplified. Watch, therefore, give strict attention. Be cautious and active. Do something. That's what that word watch, therefore, means in the Greek. For you know neither the day nor the hour when the Son of Man will come. It is a, it's not requesting. It's saying watch for his second coming. Keep your eye on the prize. Romans 13, 11, besides this, you know what a critical hour this is? How it is high time for you to wake up out of your sleep? Get real. For salvation, final deliverance is nearer to us now than when we first believed. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Watch ye, stand fast in faith. Quite you like man, be strong. In the Amplified, be alert, on your guard, stand firm in your faith, your conviction, respecting man's relationship to God and divine things, keeping the trust and holy fervor born of faith and a part of it. Act like men, be courageous and grow in strength. So what are we supposed to be watchful of? 1 Peter 5, 8 says, be vigilant of the devil. Same thing. Pay attention. Pay attention. What kind of stuff should we be watchful of? Our government just passed a bill called the Inflation Reduction Act. In that bill, our government is now hiring 87,000 more IRS agents. It fills Arrowhead Stadium in Kansas City. Football stadium full of IRS agents. But the curious thing is, you can go on the IRS website and look for these qualifications. Let me just read it to you verbatim. And and this, this week, the final hour podcast... It uploads on Monday afternoon. We, we talk about all this, but listen to this. It goes through the basics, hours and things like that, but then it says, maintain physical readiness to effectively respond to life-threatening situations on the job. Aren't you people accountants? <laughs> Carry a gun, which will be an AR-15, and be willing to use deadly force if necessary. Over taxes? Participate in arrests, execution of search warrants, and other dangerous assignments. So they're hiring an army of 87,000 people, calling them IRS agents and giving them uh, AR-15s. And they've set aside 80 million rounds of ammunition for this little army of tax agents. Does that make you curious? Does anyone care? This is your government. On top of that, we have an illustrious Gavin Newsom out in California. He's the governor out in California. Real winner. Newsom has signed a law that lowers the penalty for anyone sodomizing minors. The language in the bill hides what it actually is, but when you break the bill down, it which is pedophilia and rape of an underage child, and it lowers the allowed time that the pedophile serves in jail. Just hopping on top of that, out in California, Senate Bill 107, which just passed out of a California Assembly Committee. This is why people are moving out of California in droves into into Tennessee and Florida. Um, But let's just hope they don't go down there and ruin those states, right? Let's hope it's the right kind of people that are just trying to get away from it. But this bill that just passed last week would give emergency jurisdiction over a child if the child has been unable to attain gender-affirming health care, gender-affirming mental health care, what that's saying is the parents do not, that if parents do not support a child's gender transition, the state of California can t- declare a state of emergency and take custody of the child. 
emergency powers are not new in California. That governor out there held on to his with COVID for more than 800 days. And we're seeing this emergency power thing become an abuse because this bill would allow the state to claim custody over any child that may have run away to California. Or is your child visiting on a family, family vacation? They can claim custody of your child so you don't want to take your vacations with your little kids to California. They are calling parents who disagree with modifying their children's bodies as dangerous and the courts will call them unfit if this bill passes. And again, what this bill is saying is that parents unwilling to have their child subjected to gender engineers would be considered unfit. If the bill is passed, California parents who don't agree with all this transgender stuff would stand to lose custody of their children. We're talking about assault on parental rights under the guise of the attempt of the government to expand their emergency powers. I'm just getting tired of emergency powers. If you have the White House immediately after Roe versus Wade decision, make preparations to declare a health care emergency to expand abortions in the states that don't want it. On top of that, the White House has considered a climate emergency now in order to enact climate policies that have not been able to make it through Congress. We're starting to see a little pattern in the government about emergency powers policies. If the child's parents make decisions that contradict the gender ideal ideologies, declare a government emergency like they want to do in California so they can take your parent parental rights away and change your four-year-old girl into a boy as you sit in jail. If some states don't want abortion, declare a governmental emergency so they don't have a choice. If you can't get your climate policy through Congress, declare an emergency so Congress has no say. There's a name for it. It's called tyranny. Tyranny. I'm just calling a spade a spade. These are the kind of things that we should be watching. Not watching is not caring. Also, we'll talk about on the final hour podcast, there's a call for intercessors for this country from August 11th to September 11th, culminating at the Capitol steps. Have you ever heard of a guy named uh, Sean Fouch, F-E-U-C-H-T? This is the guy, and he's asking, praying Americans to pray against the attacks, the indoctrination, sexualization of, our, of American children, and many other issues. Use your authority. At least pray. I feel like the premise here in order for the church to wake up is to start watching. Satan is out to destroy this country. He's out to destroy the church. He's out to destroy each one of us individually, and you avoid that by being watchful. And understand what he's doing. And understand his methods. And when he's using the government as a tool to question the government's methods, if it goes against the word scripturally, and in the minimum, watch and pray. It's hard to be dead if you're watching and praying. Matthew 26, 41. For temptation, watch and pray. Watch for it. It's coming. Pray what? That you don't enter but you have to watch. If you're not watching and praying, in essence, you're in danger of falling, is what that says. It says all over the Bible, be watchful of his coming. Matthew 24, Mark 13, 1 Thessalonians 5. All these chapters have verses talk about be watchful for his coming. And I'll say one of the greatest tragedies of the church today is not watching for that. Most churches don't even believe in the millennium. The Bible is very clear about watching for false teachers in the last days. Remember the church at Ephesus, the one thing they did right is they were watchful. And they weren't buying into every apostle that came down the road. Revelation 3, 2, be watchful, strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. I have not found thy works perfect before God. Strengthen the things which remain. There are great biblical truths that are being lost, if not discounted, today. Justification by faith. The reason the church split from the Catholic church, another great truth, is the perfection of actual Bible. I'm talking about preachers and pastors that truly believe 
that the church is built on a word of God that doesn't have error. Error. You know baseball? When a kid make an error. Error. Everybody on the bench? Never mind. Okay. <laughs> Tom Clapp now. Hey. We're not talking about translations here. Pastors and preachers that truly believe the word of God is not, there's no error. It's God breathed. Every word, he breathed it. You'd be surprised how many preachers don't believe that. What about the subject of depravity of man? Oh, there's a little bit of good in everybody. Do I look weird when I do that? That's one of the reasons Jesus Christ had to die for us. You can't find any place in the Bible where the heart is repaired. There's no way to repair us as human beings. Our hearts get replaced with a brand new heart when you're born again. Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The Bible says without Jesus... And there, the one, one translation says, your heart is incurable. That's a truth in the Bible that's been forgotten. Because that's what Jesus, one of the things he died for. Can we put the sculpture up? It's what he bled for. Is ripped to pieces for. Revelation 3, 4. Thou hast a few names in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. They shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. So we have Jesus, Jesus himself saying, changing which members of the church at Sardis he was speaking to. He's talking to faithful people or believers that are part of the church at Sardis, who you could say held on and still had an active relationship, who weren't dead. The word few here means there were very, it's a very small group of people left in this church. Let's look at it again. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. In talking about clothing, this would have struck a chord with the people in Sardis. Because it was luxurious, upscale city, it was considered a city of high fashion. Uh, people were considered to be dressing at another level there. It's interesting how Jesus is putting this all into the realm of clothing and fashion. I think the best way in looking at this verse is Rick Renner has these little companion study guides on seven letters to seven churches. Each study guide is 50 to 100 pages on each letter. This one to Sardis was almost 100 pages. You could, you could do... You could do four sermons on Sardis if you wanted to go that deep. I'm using numerous other commentators, but I'm just going to take, take you to what he said, his definition here. They shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy, means in the Greek language, when you boil all those words down, the people who are in white are really substantial people for Jesus. He considers them special. Those whom Jesus deems to be substantial, they, enjoy, they will enjoy a special fellowship with him. In fact, he said they would walk right alongside him, not in white garments, dazzling garments. They're going to stand out. Rick Renner says, this is what should be said of you, and you can be, you can be if you set your heart there. That word for white in the Greek means dazzling. It's the same word used to describe Jesus' clothing on the Mount of Transfiguration. Revelation 3, 5. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in the white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father, before his angels. We have Jesus here talking still, and he's, he's talking to the whole church here, and I'm looking at the word overcometh. You can, you can, for, for that meaning of this word overcomes, think of an athlete, the Greek meaning, that dominates their sport and wins multiple championships. That's what this word overcoming means. That it's, it's, it's in this context that it's used. Now, people take this phrase, I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, and I'm telling you, it's not the context. 
They, they preach it. They're preaching it wrong. This is often not preached right. This is not saying that this is not evidence that a person can lose his salvation. That's not even talking about that. I don't care what you believe. If you believe in that doctrine or you don't believe in that doctrine, I'm not here to argue about that doctrine of eternal security. What I'm saying is this doesn't mean that. Okay? The, the, you're not reading it within the context it was written in the Greek language. This, again, Rick Renner said this. He was speaking to the entire church in Sardis. And if you look at the phrase, the book of life, just secular history tells us in all these cities back at that time, there was a book called the book of the living. And that book that, that, that was in the city only had the names of the people that were known to be alive physically alive. And if you were alive and you lived in your city, your, your name was registered in their book of the living. Every city had one of these. And the reason they did this is, is because they were, they were Roman citizens at the time. And it was a big deal to be a Roman citizen. All right. And it told city's officials, they had to cooperate with you to some aspect. And they had to deal with you because you were a living citizen of that city. And each one of these cities had a book of the dead. And this secular history I'm talking about that knows this, each one of the people that I, uh, at one time had their names in the book of the living, but when they died, their names would be transferred, erased in the book of the living and written into the book of the dead in the city. The word name in the Greek language, the phrase, I will blot out his name is the Greek word onoma. It means a person's reputation. I'm going to blot out your reputation. What this phrase is saying, according to scholars that I looked at, is that the church at Sardis was about to be removed off the list of living churches and into the category of dead churches. And looking at the last phrase in verse 5, Jesus says, I will confess his name before my father. Jesus is telling the believers at Sardis, if you will do what I'm telling you to do, wake up, Start watching, do something, come out of your corpse church, change your mind, you can be on top again. Because you're not really on top. If you're gonna, and you're going to stay on the list of churches that are living and be alive. You're going to be alive in the eyes of the Father. Revelation 3, 6, he that hath an ear, let him hear. As we close, what the Spirit saith unto the churches. These are the same words he spake to the seven, all seven of these churches, which are located in the Roman province called Asia. This is not Asia, the continent, okay? And, and I have to point out that we see this word churches as plural. Every time you see this phrase, it tells us all these messages are applicable to every single church, every single believer that has an ear to hear these messages are for every single church of every single generation. Let's do communion. Shall we not? Thank you, Lord. Mom. Mom, mom, mom just come up here and say it. Just, she's been wanting to say it the whole time. Here, do you want me to just bring it to you? You guys can just start handing that out. When you hear what he preached tonight about what is happening in your state because you're watching, what do you do with it? You use your a God-given authority. And you say, Satan, in the name of Jesus, you're not going to do that here. Do you understand me? You have set me in a position of authority. I am seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. When God raised Jesus, he raised me. And I'm in a position, and the Lord says in Romans 5, 17, I rule and reign in this life. That's what he says. So you're either ruling, reigning, and watching, or you're not. And those were the people that got in trouble. So you don't do this every now and then. You watch. And when God shows you something, you say, in the name of Jesus, 
That's not coming here. We're not having it in this church. We're not having it in this city. We're not having it in this state. In the name of Jesus, I take authority over you, Satan, and I say no to you. You are the lawless one, and I have authority, and I restrain you now as my position of authority in Christ Jesus. And you know what you do? You do it every day. This is what Pastor Max, somebody was laughing at me because... I have crackers in my Bible, and the reason I do, see, is because Pastor Mac, every morning we get up and say, God, we have a covenant with you, and we go down the list because, Jesus, you delivered me from the kingdom of darkness, and you put me in the kingdom of your dear son. Lord, you said in your word in Romans 5, 17, that I rule and reign because of Jesus. Now, Satan, in the name of Jesus... You're not, you're not, you're not, you're not, you're not going to do this. Today, listen to me, Satan, the blood of Jesus is against you. This is not a game. This isn't a game. If you want your family saved, if you want your family to be protected, God setteth the solitary in the family. And you just take your finger and say, tag, I'm it. And you do it every day. I mean, this is the most important thing. Pastor Mac, we, we, this, we're going to do this or else. This is the most important thing as a Christian. God has just preached to you tonight. And if you want to be dead... That means you're not watching. That means you didn't hear anything about some reduction, some act, and some people that are coming with guns. You say, no, you won't be coming. Do you understand me? I have authority, and I am an American citizen and a citizen of Almighty God. And you're not because of my authority. This is not a game. Nope. This is not. So this is the way you take care of it every day. Whatever God, get up in the morning. Lord, Holy Spirit, you show me today what I'm supposed to do in the area of watching and taking my place in the kingdom of God against the defeated kingdom of darkness. We're not going to let it happen. We're not going to have it. We're not. But it can't just be one person. This little lady right here, she can't just do it by herself. God is telling, saying to the church, get up, and you will have an overwhelming victory. Guess who? Guess who decides? Moi. That's the way it is, son. That's the way Amen. it is. That's the way it is. Thank you, Jesus. That's the truth. No, that is. But listen, listen. Um, what you, what'd you hear her do? What, what was that, five minutes? It doesn't take long. Five minutes. Okay? And I, I went to Israel just for that, just for that impartation, two hours a day, Billy Brim sitting across from me. She's not talking about Revelation and Daniel and the information I wanted to go there and get. It's, it's basically <laughs> this. Every day, lunch, or excuse me, breakfast and dinner. How she did it. The time she spent doing it, right, said she's got, what, uh, 10 grandchildren, nine of them living in, for the Lord. You know why? You know why she said nine of them are living for the Lord, and I'm going to get the other one too? I take my authority every day. I take my authority every day. And so I'm just, I'm, yes, and, and the mom never got to the crackers, but they take communion together. That's why she has the crackers in her Bible. Right. So they... I, and I found that when I do take communion, I, I use my authority. That's the first thing I do. That's part of communion, all right, for me, because it's your covenant. You're, 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 you're acknowledging your covenant. That's what, com, you're communing with him, acknowledging a blood covenant. He's so serious with him. He bled. He bled. So much, there's so much in communion. And you can take communion, and it doesn't have to be 30 minutes. 
And you can claim it. You can claim your healing and you point out things that you need. Let the Spirit talk to you. The Spirit will show you what you need to be claiming as far as your body goes, even. And so are we ready to do this? Mom got me all, mom got me all worked up. <laughs> you ready? Let's put that, can we put the sculpture up? As we just close here, Psalm 22, David was a prophet. This is, a lot of this is on the crucifixion. My God, my God, why, why hast thou forsaken me? Think about that. He said that. Think about how he must have been feeling if he said that to God. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? As he's in pain, hanging there. And it's very interesting because it says here, um, many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of ba Bashan have beset me round. Bulls of Bashan close me on every side. These are different translations. I'm surrounded by fearful enemies, strong as the giant bulls from Bashan. I contend that's in hell because he's not talking about any men. Remember how he flattened all those men when they came to arrest him and they all just fell down? They just all fell down and got back up. That was making a point. We're only doing this because I'm letting you. Well, these are bulls of Bashan that he's calling strong. A lot of scholars think these are demons in hell because I had someone question me on this last week. They have opened their mouths at me like a victorious roaring lion. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. I am weak like water. All my bones are disjointed from the cross, dropping in the hole. My energy drains away, away out of me like water. My bones are dislocated. I can count all my bones. So this flips back and forth, I believe, from hell to the cross, but mine enemies gloat over me. Think about dying like that. You're dying, you're totally, you have no clothes on. You don't have anything on. It doesn't say he was wearing a nice loincloth up there. And they're gloating as he's dying. Rip, ripped, ripped to pieces. And this is about it. This is about the crucifixion. He says, he says, the huntsmen are all about me. A band of ruffians rings round. They pierce my hands and feet. I, may, I can tell all my bones. They look and they stare at me. I can count my bones. My enemies are gloating over me. They part my garments among them and cast lots. This is a prophecy of the crucifixion that David's doing. And all that, that even Isaiah, listen, listen to this. And, and why would this go in there in Isaiah 53? Why would it say, he numbered me with the transgressors. Scholars believe that is him in line to walk into hell with the transgressors. I'll, you'll never convince me that he did not get punished in hell before he got the victory. I just think it was part of the deal. But, but, but th this is what it, communion is. It's... it's, it's, it's observing, it's discerning his broken body. He said, take, eat, this is my body. It was broken for you. Then he says, do this often. As often as you do this, remember me, he said. Remember me. We remember you, Jesus. You speak to us, Jesus. And I take it back to what we prayed I take it back that these people, they need, Lord, they need, they need a touch from you. They need to see you. They need to see you work. I just pray, Lord, that the people that are, we're not even going to have a show of hands, Lord. The, the ones that are just, they've just declined. Snap them out of it. Snap them out of it with your love. In the name of Jesus Christ, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant, cut in my blood. So often as you drink it, drink it in remembrance of me. We receive it, Lord. We thank you for the forgiveness of our sins. Every single one of them. 
past, present, and future. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. I love you Saturday night. I'm going to miss you. Next, next week, uh, Kenneth Copeland, uh, Jer- Jer- Jesse Duplantis will be here on Saturday night, okay? And then I'll be back the week after that, although you never know. You could see mom come here. You just never know. I love you guys very much. Thank you for coming to church tonight. God bless you.